And now that we understand exactly how our personality is structured, we also understand exactly where to look for in order to change or shape or mold our reality more to our liking. And it is here. It is inside this black box of your definitions and beliefs. This is your own personal reality blueprint. Whatever reality that you are perceiving, it is created from here. This is an absolute mirror of the well, definitions and beliefs that you are holding on to. Because your reality is a consequence of your actions. Duh. <laughs> your actions are a consequence of your thoughts. And your thoughts and emotions and memories are a consequence of the vibratory state that you are already in. And this black box is what is creating your vibration. This is your reality blueprint. If you want to perceive or receive different kind of reality, or any of its parts, you need to make some changes here. Then you say, that's great, <laughs> but that doesn't help me a lot, <laughs> because I still don't know how to find out what definitions and beliefs should I change and how to do that. <laughs> well, we are getting there, <laughs> but in order to get there, we'll just use another metaphor, because we need to find out exactly what is this, why do we have that, and uh, how does that work, in order to well, make some changes. Okay. So, let's say that this is your software, this is your operating system, everything else is your hardware, so this is your storage, your hard drive, this is your central processing unit, your processor, this is a device for measuring your vibration, and so on and so on, but this is your software. It is a rule-based decision-making system, and it even has a name, of course, like any other operating system, it has a name, and it's called ego. So your ego is your software. And like any other piece of software, it has an input and it has an output. In this case, input is your senses, information that you are picking up through your senses, or through your imagination. In, in a way, you can say that imagination is internal sensory input, but nevertheless. You get some information, either through your senses or through your imagination, and then this piece of software, based on some rules that are embedded in there, is creating a decision. Is that good for you or bad for you? Is that useful or not useful? And then it creates a vibration that your body will pick up and interpret as pleasant or unpleasant. Okay. So what this operating system, this piece of software does, it converts sensory input, either from your senses or from imagination, into an experience of what is right now. Now, this is very important. This piece of software has no memory of its own. It's just a bunch of rules. And it's a pass-through. So, senses, these rules, create an, uh, a vibration that will create emotion and thoughts and so on, that we call an experience. So, it is a piece of software that converts sensory inputs into an experience of what is right now. And it is a great tool. It helps us immensely to focus in physical reality of right now. It's kind of like a diving mask. So when you jump in the sea, for example, or in the pool, and then you open your eyes, you will notice that the image that you are receiving from the environment is a bit blurry and muddy and so on. But if you put the diving mask on and then you jump back into the sea, you will notice 
that the image that you are receiving from the environment is much more clear. Okay? So this is like a diving mask. It helps you to focus in a physical reality by converting your sensory inputs into vibration that your body will interpret as pleasant or unpleasant and then give you access to thoughts that are consistent with that vibration and memories and so on and so on. But there's a catch. <laughs> catch is that this is an evolutionary mechanism and its primary objective is your survival. So when we say that it will create a vibration based on rules that are stored, that some situation that you are picking either through your senses or from your imagination is useful or not useful, the question remains, useful for what? And the answer is useful for your survival. It is its primary objective to perceive reality as it is right now. It has nothing to do with future and past. And then give you well, info about is that situation useful for your survival primarily. Okay? And when we are born, we, we all get version 1.0 of ego. <laughs> that has very few applications or services pre-installed. So you get an application for uh, well, eating, or swallowing, breast milk, for breathing, for moving your arms and legs, for crying, and so on and so on. But as we live our life, this software will constantly update itself, constantly through your experiences, or if you want to put it that way, it will be programmed by society, by your parents and friends and schooling and uh, job uh, colleagues and so on and so on. And it is a brilliant tool and it works remarkably fast. So, for example, maybe as a kid uh, you were playing with matches and then you burned yourself. And then, new rule is added inside. Matches equal fire equal bad. <laughs> it is not good for your survival. It is bad for your survival. And next time, when you see someone playing with matches, you will get, well, fear or anxiety or some emotion that will create thoughts that says, that is bad. And you are either going to run away from that fire or maybe go there and warn that other person or kid that's playing with matches that that's not very smart. That's not very good for their own survival. Okay. But, <laughs> and there's a catch. This is exactly like your computer or your smartphone. When you bought your smartphone and you put it out of the box and you switched it on, it worked perfectly. It had only a few simple applications pre-installed, like for dialing a number or contact management or something like that. But then you update it and then you add another application. In this case, you add an application called Toys and Friends and family, and school, and colleagues, and boss, and wife, and kids. And these are all completely separate applications because you don't talk in the same way with your boss than in the way that you talk to your wife, right? That's quite different. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> these are different applications. And as time goes, this operating system of your will, got, will be cluttered with a lot of unnecessary rules and applications that maybe served you once before, but not anymore. And you need to find them and delete them or replace them with application that's doing better job or job more to your liking. 
Because, you see, this application is wired for your survival. It doesn't take into account all the things that you know or you wish for. So, for example, when you see a cake, this guy here will say, mmm, cake, great, good, pleasant feeling, eat it, yum, yum, yum. <laughs> Because it is wired for your survival, cake equals sugar equals energy equal good for your survival. And even if you, are, if you are going to put some weight, if you eat too much, from perspective of your ego, that's great. Because that's just, you know, uh, food for hungry days that may be coming somewhere in the near future. It doesn't care about your wish of being slimmer or um, prettier or healthier. It just takes care of your own survival. Okay. And just put yourself in its shoes for a moment. So let's say that you've been given a task to take care of some biological entity. So you get to walk with that biological entity <laughs> and give him or her constant advices what he should or shouldn't do, what's good for him, what's bene what, what benefits him and what's bad, what he or she should avoid. Okay. What are you going to talk? What are you going to say to that, well, let's say, kid? You will be constantly nagging. If your primary mission is for that kid to survive, you will be constantly saying to him or her, <laughs> you are not good enough, you are not smart enough, you are not strong enough, you are not fast enough, you are not wealthy enough, you are not likable enough, you are not pretty enough. Because each of these parameters if you somehow improve them, will help your survival. I mean, being smarter will help you in your survival. Being faster, being stronger, being prettier, being more likable or whatever it is. So it is constantly nagging us. And these days, ego has a really bad rap. <laughs> to the point where Quincy Jones, famous musician, uh, defined it as just an overdressed insecurity. And that's certainly one way of looking at it. But is it really fair to blame our own poor little ego for being full of insecurities or for being a control freak? It is doing its job. It is exactly what it is designed to do. And what it is designed to do is to take your sensor inputs, both external or internal, through your imagination, and according to the rules that are stored here, your definitions and beliefs, gives you a full experience of life. Together with its own assessment of if that situation is for you useful or unuseful, good or bad, it will give you a vibration that your body will pick up and interpret as either pleasant or unpleasant emotion. And that is all that it is designed to do. It is designed to work in the here and now. Even if you are using your imagination to conjure in your mind scenarios that maybe will never even happen, your ego will give you an, its own assessment, according to the rules stored in its definition of list, of that, imagine, that situation that you're imagining right now. It has nothing to do with past, it has nothing to do with future, it is always in the here and now. But if you are unaware of that, <laughs> and you keep using your ego, to give advice about situations that are either in the future or in the past, you will get a kind of a lot of nonsensical well, advices or responses. So maybe you can ask your ego, how can I ensure my survival? How can I myself safer in some unforeseeable future? And of course, your ego will give its own assessment 
according to the, its primary objective that you should survive. <laughs> and then it will tell you, it will whisper in your ear, or maybe it will scream in your ear, <laughs> things like, don't share your food, don't help your colleague, crush the competition, be greedy, take it all. <laughs> And sure, you can say that it is a reflection of ego's own insecurities, but, you know, do you really want your ego to be confident? <laughs> it's like, for example, you hire a bodyguard. And you hire a bodyguard because it will help, that guy will help you to, well, stay safe. And then you are going to make a public speech, for example, in front of thousands of people. And your bodyguard says, you know what, I'm confident that there are no dangers out there. You go, I'll just grab a coffee and I'll wait you here. <laughs> I mean, you don't want that, right? <laughs> You'll say to your bodyguard, then what, 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 what are you here for? <laughs> Why did I hire you if you're just going to leave me in a situation that's, that's possibly well, dangerous for me? Of course, I want you to be insecure. <laughs> I don't want you to be confident. But blaming ego for giving you all kinds of advices that are well, designed to keep you safe, you know, it's just like blaming a kitchen knife for cutting you. And I don't mean blaming the manufacturer, I mean that's stupid too, but blaming the object, the knife, because you were chopping some carrot and then accidentally you cut yourself. And now you're blaming the knife for cutting you. I mean, ego is just a tool, <laughs> you know, and exactly like a kitchen knife. You know exactly when to take kitchen knife, what to do with the kitchen knife, uh, when to you know, put it aside. You are not walking uh, on the street uh, wielding your kitchen knife in your hand. But that's exactly what we are doing with our egos. You know, because we don't understand that it is just a tool. Somehow it feels real, because that vibration that your ego will give you, will create a certain emotion. And that emotion will create certain thoughts. And that you are going to identify with those thoughts. You will believe that it is you that it is thinking that. And then you will act according to those thoughts that are uh, in a line of don't help anyone, don't share your food, crush your competition, <laughs> and so on and so on. And that will give you well, that kind of reality that's not exactly pleasant. So the problem is not in the tool. The problem is with your identification with it. When you take a kitchen knife, you don't say, this is part of my body, this is me. Whatever this knife uh, is doing, it is somehow connected with my being. I mean, it's just a tool. <laughs> you take it when you need it and you leave it when you don't need it. And that's exactly how ego should be treated. And so, the first order of business in uh, debugging or uh, correcting uh, definitions and beliefs that are stored inside your ego is to stop identifying with them. It is just a counselor, it is just an advice. You don't need to take that advice. <laughs> you can always override that advices that you've been given from your ego and do whatever it is that you wish or that you please. But certainly getting advice that you are in a mortal danger right now is extremely helpful. So yes, ego will act like your own insecurities and it will make you control freak. Um, that wants to be uh, in control of every little thing and then you will create a lot of plans and then you will be angry because your plans failed to materialize. But that is just because you are identifying with the counselor. And the whole purpose and the only point of the counselor is to keep you safe. 
And how can you disconnect from that counselor? How can you stop identifying with your ego? Well, through the meditation. There is no other way, at least, that I'm aware of. <laughs> so, in meditation, you observe your thoughts and your emotions and your body sensations and perceptions without any judgment. And bit by bit, you begin to listen to those advices that you've been given through ego, but you don't necessarily act them out. Because you know that it is just, actually it is a reflection of your own rules stored inside a software operating system that is designed to give you a sensation, based on those rules, <laughs> of is that situation in here and now for you useful, unuseful, good, bad, and that sensation will be either pleasant or unpleasant. It has no mind of its own, meaning that it can be reprogrammed. And that is the crucial point in all the theory of manifesting abundance. It is reprogramming those rules that are stored inside your black box of definitions and beliefs in a way that are more, well, in alignment with your true preference. So, when you notice, when you notice that something that you either picked up seen, heard, uh, tasted, and so on, or Im imagined, and th then you notice that you are getting a sensation that is not exactly uh, well aligned with your preference or with your liking, that's well your clue to examine what exactly are the rules, definitions and beliefs stored inside your ego that are creating that kind of sensation. And when you find the definition and belief that is out of alignment with your preference, you just change it. And then this machine will work differently, well, more to your liking. And a good place to start is always by understanding your motivational mechanism. And your motivational mechanism goes like this. You always, 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 no fail and no ex exception. Move in a direction that you believe most strongly serves you best. And you always, 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 no fail, no exception, move away from things that you believe most strongly do not serve you. In other words, you choose an option that you believe most strongly is more pleasant or less painful than the alternative. It, it, that seems beneficial to you more than the alternative. That's pretty much the same thing. And how are you going to do that? By being conscious, by being witness of your emotions, thoughts and actions and so on and so on. So, maybe you will notice that uh, emotion that you are getting from a certain situation that, for example, you prefer is unpleasant. And then your thoughts are going to reflect that, fear, for example, and then your actions are going to reflect that and you will see, hmm, why am I always doing things in that situation that are actually contrary to what I think I should be doing? And in order for that to happen, you need to meditate at least 15 minutes a day. You need to sit in, you, in the witnessing perspective, observing your thoughts and your actions and your emotions. Otherwise, it will just feel natural. You will be sucked into that vibration that you do not prefer, or fear, or anger, and so on, and then your mind will conjure all kinds of excuses and reasons, and you will act in a way that's consistent with your thought, but not, not always consistent with your preference. And the two piercing questions that are going to go through your system of definitions and beliefs 
are like this. So there are two of them, some of them, sometimes the first one will work better, sometimes the second one, but one of these two will always work. So you notice that you have either unpleasant emotion or bad thoughts, uh, like depressing thoughts, or that you are reacting in a way that you do not prefer in a situation that you perceive, uh, for example, it should be pleasant to you, but it's not. Then you ask yourself, question number one, what is the worst possible thing that might happen if I do it anyway, according to my preference? And second, what am I getting out of this situation as it is? And your mind will trick you into believing that you don't have a choice, that what you are doing consistently when faced with certain situation that you are either imagining or that you are picking up through your senses is the only, well, reasonable thing to do. It will have its own reasons, but please remember, reasons are coming from your mind, from your thoughts, and they are heavily influenced by your vibratory state. Actually, 100% consistent with the vibratory state that you are already in, and the vibratory state that you are already in is generated by your ego, by your system of definitions and beliefs. And yes, you always have a choice. You always... In many situations, you will feel like you don't have a choice. But that's just an illusion. It's just your mind playing tricks on you. How about you go and talk to your boss about giving you a raise? Yeah, maybe not, you see. And now just sit back and enjoy the avalanche of bullshit that your mind is going to conjure. Actually, your ego is going to take that situation, in this case from imagination, what could possibly go wrong if I go there to talk to my boss about giving me a raise? It will go through your system of definitions and beliefs and it will give a feeling, uh, uh, maybe not so, and that feeling will be interpreted as an, well, emotion of, for example, shame or guilt or something like that, fear, anxiety, and you will have all kind of reasons. What if he says no? What if he decides to replace me with someone who is cheaper? <laughs> what if I get fired? What, what if he gives me the raise and then all my colleagues are going to be jealous and now I will be somehow isolated from collective that's inside my workplace because everyone will hate me because I am somehow well, getting more money than they are for pretty much the same job. So you don't want to be isolated from your colleagues or for your friends. You don't want to get fired. Uh, you don't want your boss to think that you are greedy or to think that, aha, uh -huh, now he is asking for a raise, maybe he is looking for another job and that can create another kind of problem and so on and so on. So it feels more pleasant for your survival to do nothing. Because right now, you know, you are not starving. <laughs> Then to go there and ask for a raise. But, you know, what is the worst possible thing that might happen? The worst possible thing for you is for, you to say, for your boss to say, well, you know, sorry, can't do it. And that's not that bad, right? <laughs> or, for example, how about uh, explain to your colleague that she is really annoying with all her endless talks about her kids. So he's going, she's going around and uh, talking to everyone how her kids are great or not great and it's really annoying. Okay, go there and explain that to her. Yeah, but you know, and it's, that's not polite. No, it's not about being polite. It's about you don't want to get on her bad side. You don't want to hurt her because then she, she is not going to like you anymore and she is going to gossip and she is going and damn, blah, 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 all different kind of excuses. 
But actually, it doesn't have to be that you know, difficult. You go there and, uh, okay, can you, I, I really appreciate that you love your kids, I mean, that's obviously, but let's limit that to five minutes a day. <laughs> Give me one situation from yesterday that was well, especially interesting for you, and then, you know, let's call it a day <laughs> on that topic. Or how about uh, going and ask your mother to stop meddling in your life? Now, that's an unpleasant conversation, right? <laughs> because what if she gets angry? And that could create all kinds of awkward situations in your family, and so on and so on. Or how about going to your father and explain to him that you really do like your job? You don't want to become a CEO, you don't want to become a president, and also being a freelancer doesn't mean that you're unemployed, and so on and so on. How about public speaking? You know, what is interesting about public speaking, a lot of people are terrified of public speaking, but if you think about that, you will notice that anxiety grows with your perceived uh, well, importance of the speech that you are giving. So when you talk to, with your friends um, about a topic that you really like or enjoy, or something that's going on uh, in your company, or maybe even you are presenting a product that you are working on to your friends for advice or whatever, then that anxiety is not bad, that bad. But when you need to sit in front of your boss and your customers and your colleagues, Anxiety kicks in because you, you believe it to be extremely important. What is the worst possible thing that might happen if, well, that presentation goes terrible? And then you will see your mind giving you all kinds of beliefs and reasons. I might get fired, or everyone will see that I'm failure, that I'm incapable of public speaking, that uh, someone else should do my job, I'm not a good fit for a project manager, and so on and so on. But when you relax, when you don't think about uh, the importance of that presentation, then everything just flows. And when you do that presentation in front of your friends, it just goes brilliantly. Or how about uh, dancing in uh, parties, at the parties? Do you dance at the parties? Now, if you don't dance at the parties, ask yourself, what is the worst possible thing that might happen? Or, what am I getting out of that situation not dancing at the party? You don't want to be embarrassed. You believe that you are a bad dancer. You believe that everyone will judge you. And so on and so on. These are all just beliefs. And you will also uh, see people uh, saying things like, uh, for example, it's easy for you to have an exciting life because you live in a big city. Or it's easy for you to have a brilliant, great job because you are so smart. And then you say, okay, maybe I do have an exciting life because I live in a big city and not in this small village that you live in, but why don't you move? <laughs> you can move to the big city. And then you will see their own limitations, their own limiting beliefs and definitions. And they will say things like, I don't know, well, it's not that easy for me. I already have a job here that I hate. I already have a house here, and if I move to a big city, I must pay rent, and I don't have enough money for that. But actually, what's behind all that situation is a belief, or at least suspicion, that I'm not good enough, uh, I'm not going to get a job, uh, and I'm going to run out of money, and then I will be forced to come back to the village that I came from, and uh, then everyone will understand and see that I'm a failure, and I'm incapable of whatever, blah, 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 blah. But what is really interesting is when you face uh, those people, let's say that that's not you, <laughs> maybe it is, but let's say it's not you, 
When you face them with their own limitations, it usually doesn't go very well. So, for example, your friend from childhood will say it's easy for you to have an exciting life, you, have, you live in a big city. You say, why don't you move? Oh, you know, I can't because I need to take care of my parents. And then you say, but your parents are fine. I mean, they are a bit older, but they are healthy and they are perfectly capable of taking care of themselves and they love you and they want you to be happy. And if you are unhappy here and you're going to be happy there, I'm sure they are not going to complain about that and so on and so on. So when you face those people, including yourself, <laughs> with a situation, with, well, reasons, to uh, somehow go beyond their own limiting beliefs, one of two things usually happens. First one is they go into full denial, shutdown, apathy, depression mode. And they will say, yeah, yeah, right, like that's that easy. Or you don't know how how what's my situation and how could you possibly know um, what I feel like or what I should do in my life and it's not easy to be me and I have all kinds of responsibilities here and so on and so on and they will just stop talking about that. That's first possibility. The second possibility is that they are going to explode in anger. So you will tell them for example why don't you move in a big city? How can I move in a big city? I mean, I have so much responsibility here, it's completely impossible. And that's really interesting to watch. But why is that? Why do we feel the need to defend our own limiting beliefs? If left unchecked, of course, if you are meditating regularly, you will be able to notice that once you are faced with a certain limiting beliefs that you're holding on to, that you react in a way that's not exactly well, useful. <laughs> but why exactly is that we uh, react in a way that's completely well, unconstructive? You see, it is the trick that limiting beliefs are using to perpetuate themselves. Our limiting beliefs stored inside our reality blueprint or inside our uh, program that we call the ego or definitions and beliefs, however, they, they, they don't want to be exposed. They, don't, they will create uh, some kind of aura <laughs> that will um, somehow influence your thinking in a way that you will perceive them to be unbreakable. Okay, They need to lie to you in order to convince you they are true, because they are not. And they know that. I mean, they don't have a mind of its own, but they are designed to give you full experience of the vibratory state that they are creating. So, you know, they will use your own motivational mechanism against you. It is a fear-based vibratory state. Your, fe your, your fear or any emotion that is fear-based, all those from the map of consciousness that are below the level of 200. So, whenever you feel fear, embarrassment, shame, guilt, irritation, resentment, anger, jealousy, uh, disappointment, envy, discomfort, anxiety, apathy. These are all unpleasant emotions and you should ask yourself, we're suggesting that you ask yourself, why that uh, situation, why that, um, that I picked up from my senses? Maybe someone asked me, oh, come on, come dance with us. Or why don't you move in a big city? Or why don't you ask your boss for a raise? Or why are you allowing that lady in your office to bother you with endless stories about your kids? <laughs> okay. Your system, your program, your rules inside your ego are going to create unpleasant emotion. And you should ask yourself, what exactly 
is the belief that I'm holding on to. And I'm saying that I do not prefer, but actually I'm doing that. And when you find it out, you will see that it is nonsensical, it, it is stupid, it doesn't serve you in any positive way, and you can just let it go. And by doing that, you are changing the program here. And next time when you think about that same situation or you uh, go through that same situation, so either you, it happens to happen <laughs> or you are just imagining it, it will feel different. It will put you in a different vibratory state. And then you will have different kinds of thoughts and different kinds of actions are going to come out of that vibratory state, you will perceive a different kind of reality. Actually, it doesn't matter, at first at least, if the reality changes. The true proof that you've changed your system of definitions and beliefs is when you react. When you react, remember, action is the language of the physical reality. When you react in the same situation differently. So yesterday, someone told you, come dance with us, and it created unpleasant feeling, uh, unpleasant emotion of, let's say, anxiety, and it, then you uh, conjured all kinds of reasons, oh, I cannot today, maybe next week, and so on and so on, and you did nothing. You didn't go to that dance. But then you ask yourself, what am I holding on to? And then you realize that you're holding on to some imaginary shame that you are maybe <laughs> going to feel and that uh, you believe that everyone will judge you, but no one will, because everyone just thinks of, of it himself. <laughs> no one thinks about you. <laughs> and then you can say, well, that was stupid, of course, but I liked, I loved the dance. And next time when you are called, you will feel at least neutral, but maybe even positive emotion. At least, well, it's a kind of a good thing that your friends are calling you out with them. I mean, it's a kind of compliment. And then you will have a thought, yeah, I should go, and you will do that. And that is the proof. When you, in the same situation, act differently, doesn't matter if your reality changes at that particular moment, it will. But in physical reality, there is a certain inertia. So sometimes it takes a few days, sometimes it takes a few months, sometimes a few years to really change your reality according to your uh, change that you've made inside your definitions and beliefs. But usually it's very, very fast. It, usually we are talking about hours and sometimes days. It is rarely months or years. So, when you find limiting belief, you can let it go. And you will change your emotion ab ab about that situation, your thoughts, you will act differently and that will change your reality more to your liking. And in order to do that, you need a very important tool. And that tool is courage. I mean, that's obvious. If things that we do not prefer, that our ego based on rules or inside, perceive as threat, uh, because shame is also a form of threat. You don't want to get uh, you know, expelled from the society. So, all those lower level emotions, and if you remember, yeah, shame and guilt and apathy and uh, uh, sorrow and sadness and fear and uh, desire and also anxiety and also pride and also anger and so on and so on. These are old fear-based beliefs, fear-based vibrations, sorry. And if you remember when we analyzed the map of consciousness, on the level of 200, somewhere, somewhere in the middle, it was a breakthrough level of 200 that we called courage. And we emphasize that courage is your key to the higher, um, higher levels of consciousness or to higher vibratory states, to positive vibratory states. You need courage to face your own limiting beliefs because your limiting beliefs 
will fool you into believing that they are the only possible uh, well, way to perceive things. And that's going to happen in the, always in the same way. You will be faced or you're going to imagine certain situation, your system of definitions, your program based on rules that contain limiting beliefs, fear-based beliefs, will create unpleasant emotion and then you will have thoughts that are consistent with that and you will take some action. But if you find out what exactly is that you are holding on to and you do not prefer, okay, then using courage as a tool, you can transcend that. But before we continue, let's see what is exactly the definition of courage. You see, I noticed that many people believe that courage, courage is the absence of fear. But actually it's not. <laughs> because without fear there will be nothing to be courageous about. Courage is when you feel fear. But then you go ahead and you act in a different way anyway. Okay? So, unless you are in a mortal danger, and that's using ego for exactly what it is designed to do, to, through your senses, uh, give you um, advice or a conclusion if that situation is useful, unuseful, good for bad, in the real time, right now. So, unless you are in a mortal danger, actually, fear is a compass showing you way where you should go. It is like a messenger knocking on your door, tok, 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 and saying, look, you have some limiting fear-based belief there. <laughs> and you should really investigate it. It is really in your best interest. And we would strongly suggest that you don't ignore that call. Because otherwise that situation is just going to repeat itself in maybe just a tiny little bit different setting or in different circumstances. But unless you address your own limiting beliefs and definitions, you will just going to get that situation again and again and again. Well, at least <laughs> until you address it. <laughs> in fact, as Jiddu Krishnamurti taught us, you can only be afraid of what you think you know. Or in other words, you can only be afraid of what you believe to be true. Let's say that you hate your job. And actually, according to some research, 85% of workers worldwide hate their job. Let's say that you're one of them. So, you don't like your job. Actually, you hate it. Why don't you quit? Now, ask yourself that question honestly. What is the worst possible thing that might happen if I quit? Or, what am I getting out of that situation of not quitting, of staying in that job? First, when you ask that question yourself, it's going to be, of course, so you're imagining something, quitting your job, it will be filtered through your system of definitions and beliefs, and it will give you probably a feeling of anxiety, some kind. Anxiety is a form of fear. What are you afraid is going to happen if you quit your job? And then you will see all kinds of excuses. Because I need that money. Because I'm too old, I'm too young, I don't want to find an, to search for another job, and so on and so on. And probably fear will come in. Or anxiety, anxiety is a form of fear. And how are you going to find exactly what's going on or how you're going to resolve that situation is by not running away from your own fear. That will be your first impulse. So, that fear that you are going to feel when you ask yourself a question, what is the worst possible thing that might happen if I quit, 
will generate a fear and that is very unpleasant emotion and you you are either going to just stop thinking about it or conjure a few reasons uh, why you cannot do that and then <laughs> stop thinking about it because now that you have thought about it a little bit it is simply impossible but you see it is not you who is you are, it is not you who is doing the thinking in this case thinking is doing you now these thoughts that you are going to get these excuses that you are going to get from your mind are coming from your emotional states of anxiety and fear and they are going to create action of no action you are just going to stay in your job and you will choose to stay in that job now this is incredibly important to emphasize it is your choice but there is a way out and the way out is by playing a game <laughs> And that game is called And What Then? Or And Then What? <laughs> so, let's say that I quit my job today. What is the worst possible thing that might happen? It's terrible. Okay, okay. So you quit your job. What then? Well, then I'm left with no income. Okay, and then what? And then uh, I am going to, uh, I don't know, I am not going to be able to pay my bills. Okay, and then what? Then I won't be able to pay my mortgage. Okay, great, then what? Then bank will throw me out of my home. Okay, then what? And then you continue that line of and then what? By, by searching for the absolutely worst possible scenario. And it usually like in 99% ends in you being uh, starving and uh, living under the bridge uh, in the heavy rain, <laughs> frozen to death. <laughs> well, is that really going to happen? Now, ask yourself this question. Let's say that tomorrow I lose my job. Maybe I'll get fired. What am I going to do that? then? Well, there are plenty of things that you will be able to do. For example, you can go look for another job. You can freelance for a while. For a while. You can uh, ask friends and family to borrow you some money. Maybe even the bank. But definitely you can go to your bank and say, you know, I, just, um, I'm just, I was just fired yesterday. Can we just postpone our mortgage payments for three months, six months? And they will be happy to do that. Because they would rather give you uh, six months of um, well, grace period than to foreclose your home. That's a, that's a, lot. <laughs> that's a lot of job for them. <laughs> they don't like that. So there are plenty of things that you could do. When you think about that and when you when you are actually faced with that situation, it's not that bad. But when you, you're conjuring, when you're imagining uh, you quitting your job that you really hate, all kind of terrible uh, definitions and beliefs will be revealed and that's great. But in order to, you, to force them to reveal themselves, you know, you just need to be able to stop and hold your ground, not run away from unpleasant emotion that is going to happen and from all the thoughts that are going to give you reasons not to do that because those thoughts are consistent with that vibratory state of that emotion. So if that emotion is fear, your thoughts are going to fear based. You need to be able to stand your ground, then recognize that limitation. So, I believe that if I quit my job, I'll die, I'll starve. Then admit it. Okay, I believe that if I quit my job, I'll starve. That's interesting. Let's work from that. Accept it. Own it. Then analyze it. Is that really true? And then you will be able to change it. You just go through the worst possible scenario in your head and you will see that from the moment that you quit your job to the moment that you are really dying, starving in the cold, 
maybe years <laughs> should pass. And in the meantime, anything can happen. You can find another job, you can freelance, you can help in the construction. Maybe it's not your uh, primary interest, but for a few months, why not? And when you, when you use your courage to face your own fears, you will shed some light on them and they will dissipate. You will see them for what they are and they are just smoke and mirrors. And they don't want you to uh, well, see their, them for what they are and that's why they are going to protect themselves by creating all kinds of unpleasant emotions and reasons for you not to take that course of action. Or for example, maybe you are stuck in a really bad relationship, and, but you are somehow still choosing every day, you are choosing every day to stay in that relationship that you say that you do not prefer. Maybe once it was brilliant, you loved each other and everything was great, but not anymore. And, but somehow you're stuck. Why are you stuck? What are you getting out of this situation of not well, quitting or leaving from the? And you're getting a lot out of it because you are afraid of loneliness, because you are afraid that you will be judged and your mother and father are going to be really disappointed in you because once again you proved unworthy because she left you and of course you are going to say I left her but nevertheless that wouldn't happen if you were you know, a better person and so on and so on and that all, everything that's in your mind uh, going to happen if you leave that relationship is going to feel unpleasant and you are going to have thoughts that are consistent with that, fear-based, and you will decide <laughs> that it is better not to leave and you will take an appropriate action of not leaving and you are going to get an exactly the same reality. But when you see, when you examine that situation, first you own it, and accept it and own it, when you own that situation and you think about that, really it's not that bad. Actually, maybe you will well, understand that it is better to be happy alone than to be miserable in a company. But what's stopping you is not here, is not here, it's created here from your definitions and beliefs what exactly relationships are for. What do I believe is going to happen if I leave? What is going to happen if I stay? And for some reason, for some reason, the thought of leaving feels bad and the thought of staying feels better. And your motivational mechanism works, you will, as your motivational mechanism works, you will always take a course of action that is more pleasant or less painful than any alternative. In this case, staying in bad relationship feels better. You're going to stay. If you want to change that, find definition or belief that is creating the sensation of, well, staying as more pleasant than leaving. But you know what your ego that is only trying to protect you, will in that way uh, somehow fix you in the victim mentality. You see? And victim mentality has a lot of advantages. A lot of advantages. Something seems safer. Uh, there is a term comfort zone. You believe it to be less painful to do something than to try and confirm your own suspicions about your own unworthiness and so on and so on. And there is a really one brilliant quote that you probably heard of because it's really famous. And it says, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you are right. And that quote is coming from Henry Ford, 
not some philosopher, not some spiritual teacher, but entrepreneur. He understood that it is only his beliefs of uh, if you think you can do something or if you can't do something that's actually shaping his reality. So if you think you can or if you think you can't, you're always right. But what are the limiting beliefs that are standing in our own way? Well, they are personal, <laughs> of course. So it's difficult to say for sure what exactly is your personal beliefs. You have a tool to piercing questions. What is the worst possible thing that might happen if I do things in any other way, in a way that I say that I prefer? Or what am I getting out of this situation as this? But you see, there are, uh, statistically speaking, <laughs> a lot of common beliefs that are people holding on to. And for example, 